Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. My name's Ian Coulson. I'm lead HSBC Business Banking in the West Midlands. This is the fifth year that we've held an economic update in conjunction with Right Hassle solicitors, but I think it's the first time that we've done this on a virtual platform. As always, though, the event's proven to be extremely popular, and with so much going on in the world, I can absolutely understand why. Like all businesses, the last 12 months have been extremely busy for HSBC. We've all adapted to working from home, and over that time provided over 14 billion pounds of COVID support to our customers. Just to put that into context, that's over 10 years worth of normal loan volumes. Last week also saw the launch of our 15 billion pounds SME fund, part of our commitment to supporting the ambitions of local businesses across the UK, and also the development of our regional economies. Now, despite the challenging economic environment, HSBC research says that 60, 62% of UK businesses do intend to increase its investment this year. So we're really, really keen to get behind them and support as much as we can. Also, the fund's been split regionally and we've been allocated in the West Midlands 1.1 billion pounds. So please, please do talk to me and my relationship teams about how you can access this. I'd now like to introduce our keynote speaker for this morning, HSBC's Head of Economics, Mark Beresford-Smith. Just to let you know the ladies and gentlemen, there will be time for questions at the end of the presentation. Now, as we're working virtually on Zoom, the Q&A box is open at the bottom of your screen. So as we go through, please do take time to type your questions as we go and we will come to, to them at the end. Thank you and Mark, without further ado, over to you. Morning everybody. Um, so yes, yeah, quite an unusual morning actually in the context of the last year. I'm sat at home and I am on my own. Uh, the wife and the dog have uh, gone off to the uh, groomers um, for the dog's benefit. It's uh, one of the strange um, quirks of lockdown that dogs can have their hair can uh, can have their haircuts, but um, humans can't. And the uh, the kids are at school and college. There is nobody else here other than me. Uh, it's possibly the, almost the first time in the, in well, certainly the first time since last autumn. Um, ignition sequence start. Yes, um, after a pretty grim year. If you if you didn't hear any of my economic presentations uh, during um, the last year, then you're probably fortunate. They were often fairly grisly, especially back last April, May, June time. Um, but the clock is now ticking. The countdown clock is going. Uh, looking forward, certainly in the case of the UK, to some sort of some sort of economic takeoff from April the 12th, hopefully, when the non-essential shops open, when you will be able to get your haircut, and when we will be able to go into pub and restaurant gardens. Um, so quite a lot, it's quite a lot. Hopefully, will happen uh, on April the 12th. Now, as ever with these uh, with these with these old. Um, space launches from from florida or, or wherever it is possible they can stop the clock at t minus you know 1.4 seconds or something so we have to hope that doesn't happen but i think we can be we can be more optimistic than we've been for quite some time uh, that that a meaningful and sustained economic recovery is now just around the corner I spent a lot of last summer talking about the economic recovery that was then underway, but I was I was always very cautious. I always described that scenario as the high ledge scenario, uh, where we would make a partial recovery, spend the winter up on a high ledge, um, as we dealt with it, what was inevitably going to be a second wave of the virus, and then progress further towards uh, towards towards full recovery. As it happens, it wasn't quite so much a, a high ledge; it was a bit of a retreat, not a big one. And we'll see, um, and we'll look at that in a moment. Although, looking back on it, the winter the winter was the winter was pretty grim. I don't think there's any getting away from that. And uh, I, I remember in particular getting to the 31st of January and I don't think I have, you know, you, it, it is it is not a good thing in general to wish your life away. But come the 31st of January, I, I, I can't think of any month I have been more glad to see the back of than January 2021. It was it was pretty grisly. So we're looking at vaccine fueled recoveries now around the world. And really, this is, you know, you can just tell by the headlines, this is what is what matters now this year. It's it's getting those vaccines out, whether they continue to work, whether people will take them, um, so on and so forth. We are, you know, we are in a vaccine race. Now at the moment we're still in the situation of vaccine scarcity. 
uh, which is why you know whether people want them, who's got them, who hasn't got them is massive news. Come the summer, uh, the chances are we will then be in vaccine surplus. We will have plenty of vaccine. There'll be there'll be lots to go around. It will then be mostly about distribution and uptake. At the moment, it's still very much about vaccine scarcity. Um, there are some pretty um, staggering statistics out there. As we know, some small countries have managed to crack on and, and pretty much get their populations done. So is, is, Israel has got a first dose to almost all its population. The economy opened about two weeks ago. Uh, there are others, um, the UAE and Bahrain, that have also made good progress. Uh, so on this, on this leg of the pandemic, being small uh, has a clear advantage. Um, last year, being big had an advantage because, of course, you didn't have to lock down your whole economy at one and the same time. So being small now, that now brings benefits. Doesn't, of course, help the global economy much if Israel is up and running again. Um, it's the, in terms of the global economy, it's the big ones that count, but it, but it certainly, but it certainly helps Israelis. So the so some of the bold statistics. Um, in the UK, we've now delivered doses, first doses to 39% of the population. The Americans have done 33%. The EU have done 11%. Uh, hence the reason for, mo for a lot of the news headlines that you're seeing at the moment. Um, and we also know from the, from the regular um, monitoring of um, antibody levels, uh, this will have been a survey done a few weeks ago, that a third of the UK population now have antibodies, either because they've had a vaccine or because they've had the disease. Uh, and that, num that number will grow rapidly. And that one really is the key one to watch because that's the one that will, that, that will you know, as that climbs above 50% and gets towards 80%, that, that is the number that will, that, will, that will signal the arrival of herd immunity for us. Um, <clears throat> but around the world this year, we will, see, we will see some pretty strong rates of economic growth and you know, enjoy them. Um, but just bear in mind, they come off the back of some pretty large declines last year. In the case of the UK, um, the decline was almost 10%. Now, there is a bigger question here, and that is, do I believe some of last year's numbers? And the answer is no, I don't. Uh, measuring economic activity in these sorts of, um, of these sorts of times is really hard. You, you, it, it's, it's, it's often done on the basis of surveys. You send your questionnaires out. People are either too busy or they're simply not at their office, so they don't send them back. And you're having to impute results from much lower response rates than you would normally get. Even now, the response rates to some of the surveys, for instance, that the statisticians in the UK are sending out are, for instance, 50 percent, whereas they might once have been 80 percent. So there's been there's a lot of hairy assumptions going on in the statistical world, and it's likely that some statistical bodies have been rather more optimistic and some have been rather more cautious. I think we've been rather more cautious. I uh, this is you know, th this is not something you, you read in the press. It, so it might just be me that has these doubts. But given they had they didn't have a furlough scheme, given that they had a 20 percent unemployment rate um, in the spring of last year. I do wonder about the American stats, which report a decline in GDP last year of only three and a half percent. That to me doesn't quite ring right. I suspect it was rather bigger than that. So don't necessarily get down in the dumps because you see we've had a, a bigger fall than most other countries. Um, we certainly were not one of the best last year, but we may not have been quite as bad as we think we are. Um, for all that this year, we'll see some pretty impressive um, growth rates and growth rates that are, you know, these will not be the norm. These are these are these are recovery rates from the from the from the crisis. We will see strong growth rates this year and next. What will really matter is where your growth rates are two or three years time. The big development in financial markets in the last three or four months and there have been quite a few, the big development is that bond yields are no longer right on the floor where they were last summer. So if you go back to last July and August, the British government was in the, was in the enviable position, and it wasn't the only one, of being able to borrow money for nothing. Certainly, if it, if it had been happy to borrow money out to seven years, it would not have paid anything for it. 
the, the, you know, the investors were actually prepared to pay to hold the bonds. Now, I very much doubt they raised much money at those sorts of short maturities, because the last thing you'd want on the back of a crisis like this is to be hit with a wall of redemptions five, six years out. So I suspect they they were they were very heartened by the fact they could have raised money for, for nothing, but actually wouldn't have done so, would have raised money instead at 20, 30 years maturity. In fact, as long as long as they could push push the redemptions out. Uh, and bearing in mind, we raised the British government raised 485 billion last year and will probably raise 295 billion or thereabouts this year. So we're still in we're still in the business of raising huge amounts of money from the debt markets. And the money is still very cheap. It's just not as cheap as it was last year. The bond yields are rising. The equity markets have strengthened. Um, there, have been, there, have been, there have been some significant currency movements. Commodity prices have roared back. The gold, the gold price has fallen. All the sorts of things that you associate <coughs> with markets anticipating, firstly, an economic revival. And secondly, some sort of return of inflation. Um, they've been anticipating an economic revival ever since it became obvious back in about last October, November, that there were going to be viable vaccines. You know, until uh, before that point, they were all in. They, they were all in trial. Nobody really knew whether they were going to work. About last October, November, we knew they were going to work. The UK, I, if, I, if memory serves, licensed the first one, the Pfizer one, back on November the thirtieth. <clears throat> So it, it, it's that anticipation of economic growth and an appreciation of the huge stimulus that is behind this growth. Uh, that's the stimulus from the central banks in the form of QE. That's probably, that's probably been the least important of them this time around. Then the stimulus from governments in the form of furlough schemes and VAT cuts and all sorts of other things. And biggest of all is the stimulus that has not yet come it's Andy Haldane's coiled spring. Now, Andy Haldane is the is the uh, chief economist of the Bank of England. He made a speech in early February talking about you know, the economy being like a coiled spring. And that coiled spring is the pent up demand, particularly of households, but also of businesses. Uh, I'll show you the figures for the UK um, a bit later, but it's reckoned that households around the world are sitting on enforced savings of getting on for three trillion. Uh, three trillion dollars and that is about to make itself felt in the months ahead so it's a huge amount of stimulus to come hence the expectation that at some point down the tracks this is finally going to give us the inflation that we so missed um, and that was so absent in the past economic upswing but the bond yields are now off the floor and the financial markets are looking rather different than they were six, seven months ago. So in terms of Britain, the latest official figures we have are the numbers, the GDP numbers for January. And what it showed was, well, really what you'd expect, uh, an, an, um, an economy that is still over 9% down on where it was pre-COVID, at least the way our statisticians are measuring it. Uh, with the pain particularly being felt on the close, service, close contact service sectors, a lot of which are completely shuttered. So food service and hospitality activity down two thirds. Um, arts, entertainment, leisure down just over a third. Some other sectors of the economy um, are bigger than they were this time. They're particularly health. And it's not so much about hospitals. Um, to, a step, to an extent, what happened last year is people were, in, were, people were in hospital with COVID. They weren't in hospital for other things. But activity in our health sector has now increased above normal levels because of the huge amount of testing that we're now doing. Uh, the track and trace system that we put in place and the vaccination program. So, you know, we're doing we're doing we're doing three, four hundred thousand vaccines a day. In recent days, we've been doing 1.5, 1.6 million tests. The, the pattern the pattern is very erratic because you know all the school kids are being tested twice a week, but they're not being you know, they, they, they don't want them tested Saturday and Sunday. They usually want it doing in the week. And a huge amount of activity that, that simply didn't exist before. So that means that 
output from our from our health and social work sector is now six percent up on where it was this time last year so obviously a very skewed pattern of output in terms of the monthly trend we we fell off the cliff last last march our gdp in april contracted by about a fifth we then started to revive in May. Remember, sometime in the middle of May, they sort of they 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 um they opened the garden centres again. Um, <clears throat> really got going in June. Then, especially um, th then in July, started to peter out in August. We hit a peak in October, and then we get the messy bit um, at the end of the year. We had we had a second lockdown in England during November, an abortive attempt at reopening in December that lasted for about two or three weeks. And then into the lockdown where we've been ever since, uh, which which clearly impacted GDP uh, in January, along with the Brexit process. And we think the Brexit disruptions probably knocked about a percentage point off January's figure. Um, so there might be a little bit of improvement in February as we get used to the post Brexit trading environment and maybe a little bit more in March. You know, people are getting out and about a bit more, even though there's not a lot of places to go. We're not we're not sticking indoors quite as much. The, the, the people that measure footfall in town centres are seeing an uptick. So I suspect there will be a little bit of an uplift in February, March, but nothing really to speak of ahead of April the 12th liftoff. So we do now think the strong rebound is around the corner. Yes, it, it depends on the vaccines continue to be available, continuing to work, the virus not evading them, all the rest of it. Um, but we can be more hopeful than, than, than we have been, I think, ever since this process started. We've got reopening dates set for April, May and June and the prospect that come June, we will at least be back to where we were last summer, possibly, and then, and then possibly moving, moving into areas that we never quite got to last summer, opening up entertainment venues, getting people back into offices. Um, I'm certainly hopeful that come September, I will not only be back in offices, um, but that I will also be allowed to get out on the road and come and present. and We'll be doing these events properly. Um, so it, it, it's all just around the corner. We're looking at economic growth. Oh, the wife's just back. I'm no longer in the house on my own, but she won't have the dog with her. Um, never mind. <laughs> Uh, we're looking at growth this year of just under 5% growth next year of over 5%. But forecasting these things at the moment is really, really difficult and really unpredictable. There's there's an awful lot of things going on in the mix. And I have to say, I think the growth rate next year could be stronger than we've, than we've currently got it. Got it, and I'll tell you why a little bit later. So, quite strong growth rates this, from from the from the second quarter of this year, as we as we hopefully start to exit all this and get our back get ourselves back to something like normal. Um, getting back to pre-COVID levels of GDP, middle of next year, possibly if not middle of next year, then hopefully by the end of next year. So, where's this recovery going to come from? Uh, that's pretty simple. Uh, in the end, it's going to come from the consumer. And it will come from the consumer because of the pent up demand and the enforced savings. So we think the consumer is going to do most of the heavy lifting. The government did all the heavy lifting last year. They will retreat into the shadows a bit. Businesses will hopefully do some of it too through business investment. Um, what we're not expecting is much of a contribution from exports. Um, the the change in our relationship with the EU has, as we saw last week, hit export volumes really hard. Exports to the EU were down 40 percent. Bearing in mind that's over 40 percent of our exports. Imports were down about 30 percent. Overall export and import volumes are also down pretty dramatically. Um, some of that is clearly teething problems, but some of it eventually won't be teething problems. Supply chains are going to get rejigged and therefore I would be surprised if we hit our pre-COVID export levels to the EU anytime soon. Um, and so exports are not going to be at the recovery party. It's going to be the one bit that you know, may be there for other countries, but it's not going to be there for us, at least for some time. So the gloom is already lifting. 
if you look at measures of consumer confidence, they're already starting to revive. They have been pretty subdued. Now, for a lot of people, for, well, for some people, that was about job prospects. Uh, would they lose their jobs when the furlough scheme ended? Well, we know that that is still possible, but that the furlough scheme is going to be in place now until this September and will effectively bridge the gap. Now, there will still be jobs lost. Uh, I don't think there's any doubt on that. Uh, but the numbers will not be as big as we uh, as we feared, for instance, last autumn when the furlough scheme looked like it was going to finish at the end of October. Um, so that will that will have been an issue for some people throughout this. Um, as we as we also know, this has been the opposite of the great leveller. Uh, it has been great for professional types you know, sat at home in their in, in, in their houses, continuing to be paid and working. Uh, it has been pretty grisly for people in uh, a lot of low paid uh, employments and especially for the young. So you know, there is a good reason why those numbers have looked so grim over the past year. But a lot of it is also simply about people not feeling safe. And as people start to feel safer, as they get the jabs in their arms, they will start to feel better and start to feel more confident. And I think what that does mean is that when the reopening comes this this time around, <clears throat> I think it will be um, rather it, it will be rather quicker than it was last year. Um, when things opened up last June and July in the UK, what was very noticeable is that we were much, much more cautious and much slower to get out and about again than our European peers. Uh, our footfall levels remained remained far below what they had been pre-COVID. Uh, whereas in some European countries, by the time you get to the end of August, they were pretty much back to normal. That, that never happened here. We were, always, we were always more cautious about going out. I don't see that's going to be the same sort of issue this time, uh, especially if the government manages to get um, jabs into, mo you know, in, into almost all adults by the end of July, which is, which, which is, their, which is their current ambition. So here's where the um, push to spending is going to come from. It's the money that's been building up in our bank accounts while we've been going through the pandemic, the money that we've not been able to spend uh, it's currently piling up at about 20 billion a month. Now, let's, the first thing to say is not all of that and not even most of that is going to get taken down the pub or um, to restaurants later in this year. Some of it will. Um, a lot of that consumption, I have to say, is gone for good. I might be very glad when my local pub re reopens, but I'm not going to make an active effort to go down there and drink all the beer that I didn't drink last year. Uh, our local music festival got put off last year. It's got put off this year. They're not going to run three of them next year to make up. So a lot of this, a lot of this activity is gone for good and will not be replaced. But nonetheless, there is that, there is that, there is that, um, there's that pot of money that is there to be spent and will help the recovery. Indeed, we only think that we're going to spend about a tenth of it between now and the end of next year, 20 billion. That will, that will be enough to drive that economic growth that we're expecting of around 5% this year and next. And bearing in mind, a lot of that money is also sitting with older generations. Um, not, it's not necessarily sit, sit, sitting with younger cohorts. So it's not all going to come out by any means, but enough of it will come out to make a big difference and enough of it will come out in other similar economies to make quite a big difference. The question is what will happen to the rest? <clears throat> and I think what we have to hope is that it doesn't all end up in the housing market. If it ends up in the housing market, we'll be where we were 30 years ago. Uh, the housing market has already been quite active thanks to the government's schemes. I'm not sure quite why the Chancellor felt the need to extend those schemes through ultimately to the end of September. Uh, the housing market does not look to me like it's on its knees. And indeed, that would now be the danger. Um, and it depends how old you are. But if you're as old as me, you will remember the late 1980s at the tail end of Nigel Lawson's yuppie boom. When Nigel Lawson, who ended his days in the um, House of Lords, uh, steering through um, 
uh, financial services legislation and very, very much the sort of the wise old man of British politics. But in 1988, he visited upon us arguably one of the daftest budgets of all time. Uh, he cut taxes, um, fine. He cut interest rates, fine, in the same budget. And at the same time, uh, ended double Myras relief on, mor on mortgage payments, but did so five, year five months later. Um, it precipitated a massive spurt of activity in the housing market. In 1988, we bought, we transacted about 2.3 million houses, uh, a number we've come, we haven't come remotely close to since. So that is just a warning of what can get, what, what can happen. The result was that a couple of years later, we were all badly broke in Bradley Stoke. Uh, a, a, a new suburb not far uh, from Bristol where um, there's a famous panorama program and the bulk of people seem to seem, seem to be um, in a, a, a negative equity condition. So <clears throat> that is that is the fate we need to make sure we avoid this time and this is this is where the government and the, and the Bank of England are really going to earn their stripes if they can if they can firstly get a decent recovery going but then ensure that we don't boil over the housing market. Um, perhaps a better thing would be if we used some of that money or even a fair chunk of that money to pay down past debts. It would in a way be unfortunate if as a result of this pandemic, the government ended up carrying a bigger burden of debt as it will inevitably do so, but also that households did not take the opportunity to run down some of their, their debt burden. How might that happen? It might be that we just pay off some of our existing debts, make lump sum payments of mortgages. We've already done quite a lot of running down of um, credit card bills. Um, <clears throat> that 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 would all be that would all be very worthwhile. Uh, we might start we might start repaying some of the kids' student loans. Uh, we might also decide that we don't want to take on some debts in the future that we might otherwise have taken on. You know, what, what do we do when the PCP runs out on the car? Will we, li will we lob in a bigger deposit or actually go down and see the local car dealer and try and pay him cash for the next car? He won't be, you know, they're not always terribly pleased when you offer them cash, but we might, we might choose to do that. Um, we might also, we might also wish to make bigger contributions to make sure that our kids don't run such big student debts. So all those things are possible. It's not just what we pay off now, but the debts we might not take on in the future. So that 200 billion is going to hang around for quite some time, and it will be, it will, um, it will be one of those things that us economists are going to talk about for several years. You know, what have we done with it? How much of it is left? So on and so forth. So we've had a budget the last few weeks, um, quite an exciting one by the standards of recent budgets. The the um, the traditional ponchon for professional firms and others to run post budget briefings has come somewhat into abeyance in recent years, mostly because the budgets were getting very technical and pretty dull. <coughs> Often they were not dispensing very much money. Indeed, on the surface, this one was pretty dull. Because if the if you added up all the um, numbers on the big budget budget spreadsheet and you and you tallied them all up over the next five years, uh, the net effect was one billion. I the budget looked as if it did nothing. In fact, the budget did a great deal <coughs> because what it did was in the first two years it gave us another sixty billion, but in the following three years it took it all back again. So. On top of what the government has already dished out, 60 billion is well, frankly neither here nor there. Um, it was another 30 billion to prolong COVID support measures, the furlough scheme, the self-employed payments, uh, so on and so forth. Then it was another 30 billion to get the economy moving, mostly in the form of this super deduction. Now, I will be interested on any views about whether <coughs> Um, how they're going to structure this and whether it is possibly going to cost the government as much as it thinks it is, uh, whether the uptake is therefore going to be what the government is anticipating. But it's quite an expensive scheme. So that's the first two years. Then the following three years, he starts taking the money back. The increase in corporation tax to 25 percent and 
a raft of stealth increases by freezing thresholds and allowances, personal income tax thresholds frozen, capital gains tax thresholds frozen, lifetime pension allowance frozen. Don't talk to me about that one. Um, <coughs> And, and probably and probably some others that I've missed and 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 a commitment uh, they might possibly change their mind on these but a commitment that most of these are frozen for about five years so that was the budget sums uh, why the need for all this tax clawback well it's not really a great surprise but it was interesting that he felt the need to explain it almost in words of one syllables I suspect as much for the benefit of his own backbenchers uh, who had been getting quite uppity about some of the proposed measures uh, rather than for the rest of us. <clears throat> but that's why a debt to GDP burden um, that is now over 100 percent of GDP. Now, you will see many ways of quoting these figures. The government's favoured way of quoting these, strangely enough, is not over 100 percent. They they miss out a whole load of the bank stuff. Um, that relates to the financial crisis and various schemes put in place by the Bank of England since they miss out a lot of those um, and have the figure at closer to 90%. But the way we've traditionally measured it, it's, it's about 110% of GDP. Bear in mind that when Gordon Brown was Chancellor, it never got above 40% of GDP. The, the effect of the financial crisis was to put it to 80% of GDP and above. They were just starting to get a handle on it. It was just starting to come down. Then we get a pandemic. And the next thing you know, it's 110% of GDP. All the budget of a few weeks does is offers a mechanism that if everything works out as planned, they will have a handle on it in a couple of years time. And it will again be starting to trend down. Uh, it will be a very long time before it's 40% of GDP. It certainly won't be 40% of GDP in my lifetime and probably not in yours either. <clears throat> so what the government now wants is businesses to invest. What they're really keen to avoid is the situation we had after the financial crisis where firms effectively spent six or seven years deleveraging, getting the balance sheets back into order. And that meant that firstly, they didn't borrow money. And secondly, they didn't invest. Now, there are quite a few differences this time. Firstly, firms have not gone into this crisis over indebted as they were in 2008, particularly with real estate debt. It is, a, it is one of those staggering statistics. And you do wonder why nobody did anything about it at the time. So by the time we get to 2008, of all the money that British banks had lent out to British non-financial companies, over 40% of that was in some way related to real estate. Um, the figure, if you went back to the late 90s, would have been 20-something you know, percent. By the time you get to 2008, it's over 40%. So a lot of that subsequent retrenchment, yes, it did take place in the real estate in, in the real estate borrowings. Um, but we're not in that situation this time, fortunately. And of course, the other thing that's happened is, is this wall of government guaranteed uh, money that's, that's been, that's been um, put in the direction of businesses currently standing at about 80 billion bounce back loans, C bills, CL bills, and the Bank of England's COVID corporate finance facility. So it's about, that's about 80 billion. So firms should not be in the same position as they were last time that they should not be feeling the need to retrench for several years. Now, I grant you there is an issue down at the bottom end of the spectrum. Um, that, that doesn't seem to be an issue with the bigger companies. Um, bigger companies today do not owe their banks any more money than they owed them this time last year. To the extent that they've still that they've still got C bills, B bills, whatever, they they paid other debt back. So they're not more highly indebted. Small companies are, which is why we've got a new COVID, uh, a new uh, COVID lending government guarantee scheme up to 80% that was announced in the budget. Thank you very much. And that that should certainly help. It should certainly help the smaller guys. Um, continue to, 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 man, to manage their increased level of borrowings. So the situation is radically different than it was uh, 10, 12 years ago. 
so that being the case, what governments want is firms to invest and they don't want them to wait. Um, what this chart, what, what this what, what this chart shows very starkly is that in terms of business investment, so it's nothing to do with what the government does, it's nothing to do with investment in buying and selling houses. This is proper investment by businesses in software and structures and machinery and IT. Um, after the financial crisis, this fell off a cliff and it took until 2015 to get it back to where it started. Seven years before we got back to pre-crisis pre, uh, pre levels. Um, nobody wants to wait seven years this time. They want it to be much, much quicker. Uh, they do want firms to invest and they want them to do it now want to do it in the next two years, hence the, super, hence the super deduction. Now, the cost of that super deduction is in the budget arithmetic at about 12 billion a year. That to me seems an awful amount of money. So hence my interest in any views as to whether, as to whether firms will actually chunk through that much investment to, 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 to require to, to cost the government those sorts of allowances. Uh, but that's but that's that's a clear message. They want firms to invest. They want to do it now. Do it while this super deduction is in place in the next two years, because after that, the corporate landscape will change. So um, I'll finish with a few remarks on um, exchange rate and on Brexit. Um, the pound has rallied in recent um, in recent months. I have to say, I don't think it's got much to do with Brexit. I think it's largely to do with vaccines and, and the fact that the markets will now be anticipating a speedier economic revival in the UK than in some other places. I think that's what's driving the pound higher. And that also leads to our expectation that it probably isn't going to last. Um, currency forecasting, I have to, just the usual caveat, is extremely difficult. You know, you, would, you, you, you have better odds putting your money on the racing at Cheltenham than you do putting your money on this lot. Uh, it's, it's very uncertain, especially at the moment. But bear in mind, most other countries will eventually catch us up. And that the UK has run a very large budget deficit. We have done more than almost any other country. You know, if, you, if, you take the, if you take the difference in budget deficits pre-crisis and post-crisis, as, is a pretty good indicator of how much governments have done. There are very few out there that have done more than we have. Um, questions will inevitably be asked in time. Did we do the right things? Did we do enough? Possibly, possibly even did we do too much? Certainly European governments have not done anything like as we have. So whatever the brouhaha over the various announcements they might have made, they haven't been as big as ours. And for one particular reason, um, the usual strictures of the EU's growth and stability pact have been lifted, but they all know they're coming back. They all know that they've only been lifted temporarily. Um, that I'm not sure. You know, I, have, I have my doubts over that whether that whether that's whether that's a great idea or not. But they all know that mechanism's coming back, so it has possibly caused them to be rather more restrained in the way they've responded to this crisis than they might have been. But we are running a big budget deficit in this uh, in this country given the given the difficulty we're having with exports it's also likely that the balance of payments might deteriorate in months or years ahead it's nothing like as important as it used to be but there is a general rule of thumb is that sterling doesn't improve when the balance of payments is more than four percent of gdp in deficit So just looking at our pattern of exports, you can see how much the EU still matters. It doesn't matter as much as it did 20 years ago. Uh, EU, EU economic growth rates have been relatively sluggish it's, since then. The global economy has changed, but it's still more than 40 percent of our exports and left to its own devices would have probably remained 40 percent or more of our exports. Um, we're now seeing a lot of dislocation. We're now seeing a lot of teething troubles. Some of them will be just that, but there will be inevitably a lot of supply chain shakeouts over the next year or two, as some British firms get cut out of you get cut out of European supply chains, and some European firms get cut out of British chains. But the first effect is going to be much the bigger of the two, and it's going to be a long time before any amount of trade deals will will make a serious dent on what we've lost from. Um, 
leaving the EU in terms of trade. So we will hopefully get a deal with the Americans. We might even join the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, the Ameri an American deal might move the economic dial for the, for the UK as a whole. Most of the other deals we will get will not. They might be terribly important for some businesses. They will not move the nation's economic dial. If you're looking for good news in this, it is the fact that if you're selling to non-EU markets, then the conditions you will encounter today are no worse than they were last year. In there are, there, there are only minimal circumstances in which they are any better. But we did, in the end, roll over most of the agreements. So, so if, you're, if, if you're trading with Japan, with Canada, um, with Norway, with Switzerland, with South Korea, the deals that are in place today are the ones that would have applied last year. We might in time negotiate even better ones, but that, that will take that. That is a process for years rather than months. But we did at least get them rolled over. There was a few left off at the end, uh, including Ghana. But I think that one's now been done. There are a few other tiny countries, mostly in the Balkans uh, and, and, and a couple of others. Uh, but they did mostly get rolled over. Just a final word of warning, it doesn't affect the UK economy as a whole, but just note the situation in Ireland. Obviously, obviously, you know, be be aware of the political connotations of that. Um, it's it's pretty tense. Um, and and the, the Northern Ireland protocol is going to be an is going to be a pretty serious ongoing issue. And you can see why it's an issue looking at that. Just look at the way the goods flow between Great Britain and the island of Ireland. And while the Good Friday Agreement, etc., means that a border across the island of Ireland was not inevitable, uh, was, was not possible, and that therefore any border had to be down the Irish Sea, you could see that economically, the flows that come across the Irish Sea are much bigger than the flows that go across the Irish border. Um, just something worth noting. And certainly, certainly it, it doesn't have an impact ec economy wide in the UK, but it certainly has an impact in Northern Ireland. So that is about your lot. Um, just to sum up, um, ready for liftoff, um, especially from the 12th of April. I think what I would envisage over the next year or two is a very active corporate landscape and very active for a couple of reasons. As we as we lift out of this, the economy is going to grow quite rapidly. There is therefore the inevitable risk that companies having batted down the hatches and survived through all of this might it might be then that they start to run out of cash. You've also got quite a lot of businesses in sectors where they're going to wake up to find that life has changed. You know, the business environment is simply not the same. Demand is different and they will have to restructure their businesses. You will find other businesses who will awake from their slumber to find that they're simply carrying too much debt and will need to shed some assets. So I expect a very active restructuring mergers and acquisition landscape over the next couple of years. I, I'm, not expect, I'm not expecting tons of failures. Um, I think a number of failures will be, you know, there may well be more than there are at the moment, but, I, but I'm, not, I'm not expecting a deluge by any means, but I'm expecting a lot of restructuring. And added to that, of course, is, is the restructuring that may also be going on because of fallout from um, leaving the EU and the various supply chain um, alterations that firms are going to have to make. There's one other thing to throw into the mix as well, is that now that we have certainty in the UK, strangely enough, uh, British assets are now looking more appealing to foreign buyers than they have for some time. The thing with markets when they get hit with something like Brexit is it's not so much what it is that worries them, is they want to know what the end game is. They want, they want certainty. They want to know how is this going to be resolved and when. Um, how, the, the, the precise composition of the solution doesn't worry them so much as when it's going to happen. So now they know they are, they are better able to plan. And 
uh, having languished relative to some other markets, certainly listed companies in the UK are relatively cheap and therefore relatively attractive. So that so that lively corporate landscape, I think, will also be um, will also will also have a bit more pep added to it by interest from foreign buyers. So let's just hope I'm right and that this time it really is ignition sequence start. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, it's fair to say that in the five years you've been speaking to us, you, the world has chucked you some pretty big events to deal with, and we're really grateful for your insight. Thank you. Um, hopefully now we will get some questions in. If you are struggling to use the Q&A function, by all means use the chat, and Ian and I can pick up your questions for you. Um, a question from me, are you able to offer any thoughts about the position regionally in the UK? Uh, very difficult. I suspect Northern Ireland's not having a great time at the moment because of the um, post-Brexit arrangements. And if you, I would hazard a guess that London has probably taken a harder hit than anywhere else. I mean, you know, the place is, the place is largely tumbleweed at the moment. Um, and there have been estimates floating around, for instance, about the number of foreign born workers who've gone home during the crisis. Yeah, and if you've got families to go to in, you know, if you're if you're 20 something years up years years of age and you've been working in a in a central London coffee shop and you've got family back in Poland, you know, why would you have spent why would you have you know, why would you have spent COVID crisis in the UK? So I think a lot of people probably have left, and the feeling is that about seven hundred thousand left from London. Um, the other, if you're thinking of other other real hot spots in the COVID crisis, it, it, it would have been the towns around the airports as well. So some of that would fall into London, but some of that would fall into, uh, into the southeast places like Slough and Gatwick, where we, where we saw huge increases in the numbers of um, people claiming universal credit, mostly you know, a, lot of, a lot of people who once worked in various ways at the airports. So I, th I think London probably taken the biggest hit. Um, after that, it's fairly difficult because and, and, I, and, I, and I would really urge you to to be very cautious about um, numbers put out by local bodies, chambers of commerce, the, 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 particularly the labour market numbers at the moment um, do have problems. We know they have problems, so be very careful of them. Um, some of some of the bigger some of the bigger surveys the bcc survey breaks down regionally that might be a, that might be a region that might be a not bad regional guide but be be, be very careful about about uh, taking too much heed um, about what local business groups and politicians might say about various regions at the moment it's it, the the the, you know, the the statistics really aren't good enough at the moment Thanks, Mark. We're starting to get a few questions drop in now. So, Kevin Hall, thanks you for an interesting talk. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, be interested to hear more of your thoughts regarding the future for financial services sold into the EU and the economic scale and impact. <laughs> um, tough, <laughs> tough. Um, whether we will get some sort of equivalence arrangement out of them in the end, I'm not sure. Whether we will want to wait around for any sort of equivalence arrangement that they might deign to give us, I'm not sure whether we might in time start taking revenge by, by um, toughening some of the arrangements that we're, what, that we're allowing them to access our market on, that's, all, that, that's also up in, uh, up in the air. Uh, because so far we've given them, we've got fairly one-sided equivalents. Um, we, we've, given them, we've given them equivalents, they haven't given it to us. Um, it, it, it's, it's something that will continue to rumble. They're, they're, after, they're after claiming bits of uh, work from London, um, they will succeed in some areas. I mean, it, it's inevitable by the end of all of this that you know, most of the derivatives that they require in the EU are going to be are going to be cleared are going to be cleared on shore. It, it, you know, they they regard it, and I think probably rightly as a, as a financial stability issue. That if you know, if if the bulk of those derivatives are not cleared on shore, so I suspect that I suspect that stuff will go. Um, but you know, it, Lon Lon London is London is a London is a very strong, well entrenched financial centre. Um, Europe Europe can take bits, and certain of its centres can take bits, but it doesn't have one place where it's going to where it's going to get the agglomeration benefits that London gets 
you know, L London is London and New York are strong as they are because you've got all the agglomeration effects of you know generations of people that have worked in financial services, generations of expertise, large pools of skilled of skilled labour, um, skilled skilled people in the hinterlands in, in, in the, out, out in the commuter belts. Um, you know there are there are things that Amsterdam and Dublin will do very well, but they simply don't have the hinterland, and and nor nor even nor even do Paris and Frankfurt. Uh, and there's some of these, and there's some of these centres, the tax, the tax, um, the, you know, as there's some pretty stringent bonus caps on Amsterdam. You know, if you're a, if, if you're a high flyer investment banker, it's not the place you want to be sent. Um, and you know, some some of the other tax treats, treatments in some of the other countries are not as favourable as they would be in the UK. So certainly some stuff will go, but it's also a chance for London to reinvent itself and start doing other things and doing them and doing them better. So watch all these reviews that are coming out. The review on listings, review on 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 the solvency regime for the insurance market, etc. There will be a lot of this going on over the next few years in London. Thank you, Mark. Um, I'll join a couple of questions together here, one from Adam Manning and one from Andrew Jones. Um, are there any sectors that you expect to do particularly well or struggle over the next 12 months? And a supplemental question to that. Can you offer a view as to why the transport and storage sector look to be hit so hard when there has been such a lot of consumer activity in the online market while we've been? Yeah, I'm afraid that none of, none of that makes up for the fact that there's no trains or buses. Or that, or that, or that, if there are, they're running around empty. Um, that's that's why transport take takes such a big hit, um, because the, you know, the 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 whole the whole public transport thing is just and, and of course no and of course yeah you know, hardly any air, um, aircraft flights. So that explains that in terms of in terms of the other sectors, I think you have to be really careful with the growth rates for some that will look really good this year, but it will be catch up, and and it's also really hard to know because we don't know we can't be sure we're going to go back to wanting to do things entirely as we did them before. I suspect the longer this lasts, the more we do want to get back to doing things as we did them before. Uh, but there's no but there's no guarantee on that. And some of this, some of this will stick. And working out what sticks, what doesn't, is going to be really tough. I mean, the, and a lot of the changes we'll see will be changes that were already in, in place where this has acted as an accelerant. So, you know, demand for office space, for instance, demand for retail space. I mean, the retail the retail environment was already was already in for a shake up. It's just we've done it much more quickly than, than, than would have than would have happened had it been left to its own devices. And in the end, I suspect that will it's a strange way. I think that I think that will be a good thing. I think you know there is there is everybody in that sector will now will now be under absolutely no illusions about what has to be done, how it has to be done. Um, and I think and I think our high streets will I think our, our high streets will evolve and change much more quickly than 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 would have than would have been the case without this. So I think in that in that's in that one particular instance, I think it's been quite a useful accelerant. Thanks, Mark. I'm going to put two together as well. Uh, so again, a question from Ian Wilson, who again thanks you for an excellent presentation, and also from an anonymous attendee. Uh, around the government's levelling up proposals. So uh, Ian asks, just wondering what, if any, impact the government's levelling up proposals might have on the economic landscape. And also, can the government now afford the levelling up agenda? Um, it's tempting to be cynical about all of these things because you know, I've, I've watched regional policy under various guises for, for the best part of 40 years. Um, None of it has made a massive amount of difference, although that's not to say things wouldn't have been worse without it. It's really, really hard to move the dial in a meaningful manner. Um, what you can do is you can you can you can ameliorate the trends that are going on, but it's really hard to move the dial. Ultimately, it's ultimately it's simple. It's you know, it, it's disarmingly simple, but it's hard to do. It's about you've got to get well, you've got to get a lot more well paid jobs out of London to the rest of the country. If you do that, the rest will pretty much follow suit. You know, living, living when, when, when you strip all the when, when you strip all the additional cost out, cost of commuting, cost of housing, etc., living standards in London and the southeast are not dramatically higher than they are the rest of the country. 
And I think most people know that. The difference is that those areas have got a great deal more well-paid jobs. So you have to move the jobs. Um, and that's the hard bit to do. Because you can build all the fancy transport links you like, but they just but you know, they make it easy for people to get to these other places. They also make it easy for them to get out as well. Uh, and that has been that has been the that that has been the long standing bugbear of regional policy. So it is it is really tough to do. Um, and it's it's also a shame in the way that you know you go back ten years ago we had a decent infrastructure in place in terms of the regional development agencies. Now, argue, now you could argue that the southeast didn't need a regional development agency. It turned out to be quite an effective one, which maybe didn't help. But that's but that sort of idea, uh, regional development agencies that that were even that were even possibly going to lead to some sort of regional assemblies. Um, but there was a referendum in the northeast. People in the northeast didn't like the idea and and the Labour government at the time then gave up on it. But that, that was where it was heading. And given, given what's happened since, that looks like it might have been quite a useful way of doing this. But of course, you know, with austerity, the coalition government came in and the first one of the first things they did was tear, was, was tear the structure down. Um, so we're now left with, with trying to sort of recreate it and do it again. Uh, and it, 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 is, it is going to be tough. The government will certainly help if they get lots of civil servants out. That 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 will certainly help, and I don't think London will have quite the sucking power that it did in 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 the twenty years before the financial crisis. It was it was one of the stark, it, yeah, that that was that was a very difficult trend to 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 counter the the huge growth in financial services in the twenty years before the financial crisis and the concentration of the certainly the value added end of that. In, in London, so it's going to be hard, but they but they certainly do need to try. And what they also need to do is not just focus on the big ticket stuff. Uh, and and I think they realise this. I mean, I mean, and I know this gets terribly political. You see the you know the allocation for towns in the last budget, but in the end, um, you've got to make you, you've got to make neighbourhoods a lot more attractive. You know, provincial city centres outside of London. Uh, are now you know, are now all pretty good. You know, I go to most of them. They're all they're, they're all pretty nice places. It's it's it, it's just, it's the sub it's some of those it's some of the inner city areas and it's just yeah you know, you've got the same would apply to London, and also some of the small towns. And it's in those small towns you really need to make a difference. It's more what I would call community improvement. It doesn't need to be expensive, but it absolutely needs to be done. Uh, people need to feel better about the places in which they live, and that that's where that's where money needs to be stuck, um, uh, spent, and actually where you could make quite a lot of difference, but not a lot of spend. Thank you so much, Mark. That's fabulous. I don't think we've got any more questions, so we can um, start to wrap up. Uh, I don't know how we actually show our appreciation for you, Mark, in these circumstances. I, if I could give you a round of applause and ask everybody to do so, I would. But thank you so much for your time. Um, it's always really appreciated when you when you come and speak for us and we always get some of our best attendances so we're really grateful um, thanks also to the HSBC team for helping us organize it and thank you to everybody for attending particularly all of our clients who've supported the firm through the last rather strange 12 months um, it's a big year for us at Right Hassle this year uh, and let's finish on a, on a positive note we're celebrating 175 years this year so we have seen some fairly big world events uh, in, in, in our time as a practice and uh, you know this this is just one of another that the firm has seen through so uh, it's it's really really good that we've had all of your support to help us do that thank you please do have a look at our website which has got some dedicated 175 content we're doing loads in the community um our events team are out delivering trees to people to care homes and all sorts of places today um as just one of the initiatives if you're a runner or a cyclist we also have a strava group so you can get your 175 miles clocked in i know i've got to sign up i don't think i'll be running though um all that remains for me to say is once again, thank you to Mark. Thank you for coming. And uh, we very much look forward to hearing from you all in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much.